from the air age, through the missile age, and into the age of space. Space is a place of knowledge. Strength has become the index to peace. The third submarine loss of 1968 would occur to a Soviet ballistic missile submarine called the K-129. Given the tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, it made this disappearance a much bigger deal in terms of political implications. The reason for the K-129 sinking is not entirely clear, and we will cover that. But some theorize that the reason for the accident is not just mysterious, but it could actually be sinister. The reason for so much speculation around the sinking is that the K-129 was not an ordinary submarine. It was a ballistic missile sub, built with sleek lines and carrying nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles and torpedoes. It was a type of submarine that just should not go missing under mysterious circumstances. But it did. And what exactly occurred is a long and convoluted story, clouded by the KGB and the CIA during the dark years of the Cold War. Laid down at Soviet Shipyard 132 on the Sea of Akosh on March 15, 1958 and launched May 16, 1959, the sub underwent its sea trials and crew training period and was finally accepted by the Soviet Navy on December 31, 1959. The K-129 was based out of Rybachi Naval Base on the Kamchatka Peninsula and would serve its entire life in the Pacific Fleet. The boat was refitted two times during its service life. The first refitment occurred in 1964 and the second in 1967. After its 1967 overhaul, the sub successfully completed two 70-day long cruises in the open Pacific. Then, in February of 1968, the sub was scheduled to go on another 70-day cruise with an expected completion date of May the 5th. The sub set sail from Ribachi Naval Base on February the 24th and reached deep water shortly after. The vessel completed a test dive, which was normal procedure any time a Soviet sub set sail from a port. It resurfaced shortly afterwards and radioed back to its home port, stating that everything was good and that they were going to set course for its patrol box. The commander of its vessel on its final voyage was Captain First Rank Vladimir Kobzar. The sub made radio contact two more times. These were standard check-ins at predetermined points, one as the sub crossed the 180th meridian, and once again as the sub reached its designated patrol box northwest of Hawaii in the Central Pacific. There were no more radio contacts made with the sub after this standard radio check-in upon its arrival inside of its patrol box. By mid-March, the Soviet command at Rybachi Naval Base had become concerned due to the missile sub missing two scheduled radio check-ins. This wasn't completely unprecedented, as ballistic missile subs operate under utmost secrecy. Their location is their most guarded secret. Oftentimes, if an enemy vessel is in the vicinity, they will maintain radio silence, even if they are scheduled to give regular check-ins. This is in order to maintain concealment of their location. But by this point, the Soviet command was concerned enough to issue a fleet transmission ordering the K-129 to break radio silence and contact headquarters. This order was never responded to. Later, much more direct and urgent radio communications were also ignored. By the third week of March, Soviet Naval Command had declared the K-129 missing and organized an all-out effort to locate the missing sub. The United States took note of this deployment of Soviet naval ships to this isolated region of the Pacific and surmised it was due to the loss of a Soviet submarine. The U.S. Navy contacted the SOSIS Command Center and requested them to review acoustic records from the North Pacific on March 8, 1968 to see if any sensors had recorded any anomalies. They had recorded a strange bang sound and were able to triangulate the data from various listening stations and pinpoint the location. They quickly realized that the location of this acoustic signal was hundreds of miles from where the Soviet Navy had conducted their search. The Soviet Navy was unable to locate the lost sub as they did not have a similar system of underwater listening stations like the United States. It eventually had to abandon the search, declaring the sub as lost with all hands aboard. After the Soviets abandoned the search, the U.S. Navy began its search for the K-129. On August 20, 1968, the USS Halibut discovered the wreck northwest of Oahu in 4,900 meters of water. The sub was surveyed in extensive detail for the next three weeks by the Halibut, and over 20,000 pictures of the wreck were taken. The wreck of the K-129 suddenly became a massive opportunity for the United States to recover an entire Soviet ballistic missile submarine, and President Nixon authorized a recovery operation to be formed. The operation was codenamed Project Azorian and would morph into one of the most secret and bizarre events of the entire Cold War. 
but the question as to why the sub disappeared in the first place would remain mired in secrets and clouded by strange stories until the present. Many theories, some extremely troubling, have been pushed forward as to why the K129 suddenly sank with no signs of distress. The more mundane theories point to the sub having a hydrogen explosion on board due to the batteries not being properly maintained or a missile booster exploding due to a leaking sill. These would be mechanical failures and would explain the K129 sinking pretty easily. But another theory is that the K129 actually collided with the USS Swordfish, which was tailing the K129 as it left port and route to its patrol location. This was a standard Cold War practice and was done by both the Soviet and the US navies. This is actually a very strong held belief of many Soviet Navy officers to this day. The US Navy, however, denies this claim. Possibly lending proof to this theory is that the USS Swordfish did port at Yokosuka, Japan on March the 17th, 1968, only a short time after the K-129 sank to get repairs to its conning tower and periscope, which had been damaged by an impact with something. The US Navy said that this damage was caused by sea ice in the Sea of Japan while conducting surfacing operations. The Russian military continued to probe whether a collision with the USS Swordfish had caused their sub to sink for decades after the incident. And in 1993, during a diplomatic meeting at the Kremlin, U.S. Ambassador Malcolm Toon gave this official statement, quote, At my request, U.S. Naval Intelligence searched the logs of all U.S. subs that were active in 1968. As a result, our Director of Naval Intelligence has concluded that no U.S. sub was within 300 nautical miles of your sub when it sank. End quote. Other than the beliefs of many Soviet leaders, there is no proof that the two submarines had a collision, causing the K-129 to sink. There is one theory, proposed by author Kenneth Sewell in his book Red Star Rogue, that if true, is genuinely frightening. This story goes on that the entire K-129 was actually raised from the depths of the Pacific, not just a portion of the sub as the US government claims. During the sinking of the K-129, strange sounds were picked up by SOSA sensors throughout the Pacific. Instead of the normal sound pattern a typical sub implosion makes, the K-129 first had a large explosion, followed later by the typical implosion sound patterns as it reached crush depth. When the sub was raised, it was discovered that one of the ballistic missiles had self-destructed, causing the sub to sink. But why had a ballistic missile self-destructed inside of the launch tube? Well, according to the author, he thinks someone was trying to launch it, but entered the wrong codes, which immediately triggers a ballistic missile self-destruction mechanism. As to who was trying to launch this nuclear missile, the book goes on to say that during its patrol, the K-129 was hijacked by rogue KGB commandos in an attempt to attack Hawaii with a nuclear missile, and blamed the surprise attack on a Chinese ballistic missile sub in an attempt to kickstart a war between the United States and China. His evidence for proving the United States was able to raise the entire sub, and not just the front portion, is the fact that in August of 1993 at a diplomatic meeting in Moscow, Ambassador Malcolm Toon gave the Russian delegation the K-129's bell, which is an item that would have been in the K-129's bridge, which was located in the cell portion of the sub that the CIA claims broke off and sank back to the ocean floor. In his book, Sewell places the Russian sub at 24 degrees north, 163 degrees west, less than 350 miles from Honolulu. His location is further backed up by the fact that the Hawaii Institute of Geophysical Research reported radioactive oil bubbling to the surface in this area at the time of the K-129's sinking. After all, the K-129 had deviated so far from its planned patrol box that something had obviously occurred. Ballistic missile submarines do not just go wherever they want without reporting back to top brass. Clearly, Naval Command in the Soviet Union had no idea that the submarine had deviated so far off of its planned route. Evidence of this is shown when the Soviets were searching for the sub. Their search efforts were so far from the actual location of its sinking, it was obvious that they were oblivious to where it had actually traveled to. When the rogue commandos readied the sub for their nuclear strike, the captain gave the agents false launch codes. When they entered these false codes into the control system to launch the missile, it triggered the self-destruct mechanism of the missile, causing it to detonate its non-nuclear explosives, rupturing the hull of the sub, causing it to sink rapidly. If this version of the sinking of the K-129 is true, the commander of the vessel, Captain First Rank Vladimir Kobzar, would be one of the greatest military heroes that has ever lived, sacrificing himself, his crew, and his vessel to prevent a massive war from occurring between the US and China. 
and possibly even triggering Armageddon. The exact location of the supposed wreckage of the K-129 is still classified to this day. There have been some limited CIA documents released about Project Azorian that say the wreck is located approximately 1,560 miles northwest of Hawaii. The International Atomic Energy Agency shows that two nuclear warheads from the K-129 were located in the Pacific at 40.6 degrees north, 179.57 degrees east, and 20,000 feet of water, but lists them both as recovered. During the secret recovery operation, Howard Hughes was contacted to build a ship capable of lifting the submarine from the bottom. But to do this in utmost secrecy, a plan was devised to build the vessel in the open, but under the guise of it being an experimental seafloor mining vessel designed to collect manganese nodules from the ocean floor. At one point, Howard Hughes even gave a press conference about the goals and ambition of potential deep sea mining. Information about the project was leaked at one point, the New York Times picked up on the story in 1974, but was prevented from publishing it by the director of the CIA, William Colby. Months after the salvage operation was completed, in February of 1975, the LA Times ran a small story detailing the operation to salvage a Soviet missile sub, shortly after the New York Times followed suit. The Hughes Glomar Explorer, which is what the specialized salvage ship was named, true purpose was on display for all to see. It wasn't a deep sea mining research vessel at all. It was a specialized salvage ship designed for one purpose, to raise an entire nuclear submarine off of the ocean floor. Now this is where the information gets murky. It's still well accepted that in July and August of 1974, the Hughes Glomar Explorer was able to grapple the K-129 with a gigantic cage-shaped claw and was able to lift at least a part of the K-129 to the surface. But there is a lot of controversy still connected to how much of the sub was actually recovered. One story states that the entire forward section of the submarine was raised, including its nuclear torpedoes, but the sail area of the submarine broke loose as the sub was being raised and fell back down to the ocean floor. The other story is that most of the sub was actually recovered, including the ship's sail area where the captain's bridge was located. This was the most important section of the submarine since it would contain Soviet communication equipment, operations manuals, location data of other nuclear subs and their patrol routes, and various types of coding equipment. The Soviet Union assumed this is what had occurred, but the CIA denies this. What was actually recovered and what sections were actually salvaged remains classified by the CIA. The US announced that in the section of the bow they supposedly recovered, there were the bodies of six Soviet sailors, which were buried at sea and given full military honors. The video of this burial has been made public and was sent to the Russian leadership by the CIA director Robert Gates on his visit to Moscow in 1992. The CIA has declared that the recovery of the K-129 was a failure because only a small section of the sub was actually recovered. But in a freedom of information lawsuit, the CIA argued that the contents of the sub needed to remain classified because any publication of this information would confirm that US intelligence agencies had taken part in the recovery of a Soviet nuclear warhead and would cause a diplomatic nightmare for the United States intelligence community. The phrase neither can confirm nor deny was the phrase the CIA actually used in court and was challenged by a Rolling Stone magazine reporter and the ACLU, and it stood. This was the first time that phrase had been used and was coined instantly into the extensive CIA lexicon that it uses to conceal its secrets and lock them away from the public, even if it was challenged in the court of law. What the actual cause of the sinking of the K-129 was, as goes the theme with other submarine disasters, we just may never know. The K-129 is a special type of disaster because nuclear weapons were involved. Whatever happened to the K-129 by now, it's clear that 1968 was starting off as a terrible year for submarines. But before the end of the year, one more submarine would disappear under mysterious circumstances. But this time, it would happen to a US nuclear sub.